Well, good morning. Uh, welcome. Please uh, feel free, open seating. Please sit anywhere you like. Um, it's an honor and a privilege for me. Uh, I'm George Cohen, part of the AOSA National uh, Headquarters, uh, and I want to welcome you to Tuesday of the annual meeting. Uh, you had the Army senior leadership uh, discussed this morning at the congressional breakfast. Uh, you've got the chief at the Eisenhower luncheon this is, uh, at noontime. So it's a great day, and this is a great panel, a very uh, a timely topic, so we'll get into it right away. Um, we really want to thank you for joining us. Uh, this Contemporary Military Forum, Home, Homeland Defense, entitled Defense Partnerships and Security of North America. And again, I can't think of a more timely uh, topic, and we're, we're honored to have you in our presence. As your professional association, the Association of the United States Army and, the, and its Institute of Land Warfare, are proud to provide forums like this one throughout the year that broaden the knowledge base of Army professionals and those who support our Army. <clears throat> These professional development seminars are AOSA's way of amplifying the U.S. Army's narrative to audiences inside the Army and help to further the Association's mission to be voice for the Army and support for the soldier. Of course, we cannot do this alone. AOSA relies on its members to help tell the Army's story and to support our soldiers and their families. A strong membership base is vitally important for our advocacy efforts in Congress, the Pentagon, the defense industrial base, as well as the public in communities across the country through AOSA's 121 local chapters. For those of you Army professionals who are not yet members of your professional association, we encourage you to join with a special introductory offer. On your seats, you'll see a little card, red card. <clears throat> you'll find, uh, you just take that card, you've got two ways to you can bring it to the AOSA membership booth, which is booth 307 in Exhibit Hall A, or you can sign up online at AOSA.org slash membership. If you're already a member of AUSA, we thank you very much for staying with us. And please give your invitation to a fellow professional. You're doing a service to the Association and to the United States Army. So without further ado and any more banging on by me, I'd like to turn the floor over to Mr. Eric Olson of the Wilson Center. Please, sir, come. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for being here this morning. My name is Eric Olson, and I am the Deputy Director of the Latin American Program at the Woodrow Wilson Center. Um, it, I'm delighted to be here. Um, the original plan was for, I think, General Buchanan to be in this role. And uh, as you may know, he has been uh, deployed to Puerto Rico uh, on a mission that's probably a little more urgent than being here this morning. So we are glad he's there, and I am delighted to not replace him, I could never replace him, but to fill in briefly uh, uh, for our panel this morning. The title of our panel, the theme is uh, Defense Partnership and Security of North America. And as we know, the North, American, uh, North America has become an increasingly important factor in global affairs. It's an important economic region, a driver of great growth and commerce and trade that's increasingly important for all three nations, but also the rest of the world. But North America is also a, a sensitive and challenging uh, operational environment for th those in working on security issues. While relatively safe, from nation state attack, it remains vulnerable to an array of natural and man-made threats and hazards, many of which strike with short and no notice. And we saw that obviously throughout the last weeks as people in Mexico and the United States and other nations have struggled with hurricanes and earthquakes. And the importance of responding to these man-made hazards is always and ever more evident. 
Um, so the efforts toward cooperative defense provides each partner nation, the United States, Canada, and Mexico, an increased awareness of the emerging threats and improved ability to limit adverse influence in the region as a whole and a greater capacity to, to promote stability throughout the Western Hemisphere and project globally beyond this hemisphere. Interoperability, relationships, and a professional appreciation of the contribution of all are paramount to achieve a safe and secure uh, North America. It's a region with great potential and also facing great challenges. And so it's important as we strive to greater cooperation and uh, working together to address these issues that we reaffirm what President Kennedy said in Ottawa in 1961. What unites us is far greater than what divides us. The issues and irritants that inevitably affect all neighbors are small, uh, are small deed in com comparison with the issues that we face together. Important to focus on the potential benefits of working together to secure our area. We are joined today by a stellar panel of experts who have firsthand and direct knowledge of these issues. I'm going to introduce them in the order in which they will speak. They will all speak about 15 minutes, and then we will have time for some questions with them, and I will open it up. I promise to leave time for audience participation as well. We have some mics set up so people can uh, queue up there and we can get some questions. We're gonna hear first from Lieutenant General uh, Reynold Hoover. He's the Deputy Commander, U.S. Northern Command, and he's also from the Alabama Army National Guard. He has over 34 years of military service in active duty and in the National Guard as a traditional guardsman. He was de Deputy Commander of U.S. Northern Command, as I mentioned. Command he was Commanding General, Theater Sustainment Command, and Joint Sustainment Command in Afghanistan, and Director of J-26 National Guard Bureau. He was a Special Assistant to the President for Homeland Security, responsible for nuclear defense and continuity of government policy. Senior, he's a member of the Senior Federal Service uh, Executive with over 32 years of federal civil service experience. He's also been in the private sector as a corporate chief counsel and a private law firm with private law firm experience. So we're delighted that General Hoover will join us and he will speak first and then we'll turn to General, uh, uh, Lieutenant General S.J. Bose. Uh, uh, he is the commander of Canadian Joint Operations Command. Um, he, uh, uh, he enrolled in the Canadian Forces in 1984 and became Lieutenant General, uh, was promoted to general, his current position uh, with the Canadian Joint Operations Command in June of 2016. Um, after General Bose speaks, we'll hear from Lieutenant General Roble Arturo Granados Gallardo, uh, bienvenido, General Gallardo. He will speak in Spanish and there will be some translation. Just to highlight a few of his uh, uh, important roles, he is the uh, uh, Chief of Staff of the Na National Defense, or Sedena, in, in Mexico. He is General Coordinator of Chief Clerk's Office at the National Defense Secretariat. He has been Chief of Staff in several military zones in Mexico, Baja California, Veracruz, Chiapas, and others. And we are delighted uh, to have uh, General Granados with us as well. Um, next, we'll hear from Sergio de la Peña. Mr. de la Peña is Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Western Hemisphere Affairs. Uh, he is responsible for security, defense, and policy issues in the region as well as overseeing the funding of defense cooperation programs for U.S. Northern Command and U.S. Southern Command. And I've had the privilege of knowing Sergio for a number of years, and I, I, I can't recommend him high enough, highly enough. A, a great uh, patriot and hardworking uh, member of the military. Um, so, and then last but not least, 
We'll hear from Ronald Vitello, Vitello excuse me. Uh, he's the Acting Deputy, Acting Deputy Commissioner, U.S. Customs and Border uh, Protection. Uh, he, Chief Vitello, Vitello entered the duty, uh, entered duty with the Border Patrol in 1985. And since uh, February 2017, he has been Chief of the U.S. Border Patrol. As its Chief Operating Officer, he, re he is responsible for the daily operations of U.S. Border Patrol and reported to the commander of CBP, assisting in planning and directing nationwide enforcement and administration operations. So we have a stellar panel with vast amounts of per professional experience and knowledge about not only their own areas of responsibility, but cooperation and collaboration uh, with partner nations. And so we are delighted to welcome all of them. I will uh, invite uh, General Hoover to begin, uh, and then we'll proceed uh, down the path. Thank you, General. Thanks a lot. Uh, uh, thanks, everybody, for being here. I, I will give you one important safety tip. Um, you heard about uh, joining AUSA and the little red card on your table there on your seat. I, I found that when I joined, part of the requirement is they're going to call you up for speaking engagements. So be ready for that. I think it's in the fine print somewhere on the bottom. But um, uh, thanks, everybody, for coming today. And on behalf of General Robinson, my boss, uh, uh, the commander of U.S. Uh, Northern Command and NORAD, uh, who would have been here today, but um, we have a few things going on at, at NORTHCOM, so uh, you, I think you're stuck with me. I'm not sure how stellar I am. I have a few classmates in the audience who will tell you war stories, so don't believe any of that stuff either. Um, I, I do want to say, uh, Mr. Uh, De La Pena, thanks for coming. It's great to see you again. Uh, you know, your support to the Western Hemisphere uh, and the things that we're doing at NORTHCOM and our theater security cooperation is, uh, is really greatly appreciated, and it is great to see you again. And Steve, thanks again Thank for you. coming. And, uh, you know, our Canadian partners to the north uh, as part of both NORAD and, and uh, CJOC and NORTHCOM uh, have a great, great relationship, and I hope uh, this morning we can uh, share some of that uh, and get a flavor, for, uh, you all can get a flavor for uh, the relationship that we do have. And so thanks, Steve, for coming in for this. Really appreciate it. Right. And General Granados, always great to see you. Uh, General Granados and I were together in Mexico City back in July. Um, we have, uh, over the last year that I've been at NORTHCOM, have really developed, a, I think, a very close relationship. And uh, it's great to see you and, and the, and the uh, I'm looking forward to seeing you again in January, I think, when we're going to get together. I'm sorry I can't come to the football game in December, but so. Thank you. Chief Vitello, thanks for coming. We've not met before, but uh, CBP has been a great partner with us uh, in our headquarters at NORTHCOM and, and uh, certainly down at JTF North, so we appreciate you coming as well. Thank you. So thanks a lot. Uh, just a couple of things I, I do want to touch on, um, and then I'll pass the microphone over. Um, first is uh, the NORAD NORTHCOM uh, mission set. Uh, I'll focus primarily on NORTHCOM. Uh, we are two commands uh, out in Colorado Springs, two commands united in a, in a singular purpose, and that is defense of North America. Um, the NORAD side uh, is focused primarily on the aerospace and maritime uh, environments, uh, Operation Noble Eagle and, and uh, um, looking at Russian long-range aviation, um, thinking about uh, civil aircraft and, and people doing bad things in a 9-11 scenario, uh, looking at the maritime approaches um, to North America and providing warning um, so that we can um, take action if necessary. And the challenges there are immense. And um, we focus on um, keeping the skies safe, and we do that through the interagency community and, and uh, in partnership with the NORTHCOM mission set. On the NORTHCOM side of the house, we, probably, we have three missions. Uh, homeland defense, which is primarily our ballistic missile defense program. Um, and then our second mission is uh, defense support to civil authorities, which I'll tell you and happy to talk about that if you have questions. But um, we have now been approaching uh, 50 days of 24-7 operations in our headquarters on the NORTHCOM side, responding to Harvey and then Irma and Maria and Nate providing some support and relief uh, to Mexico in the process uh, for the three earthquakes that they faced, while at the same time doing our homeland defense, ballistic missile defense mission. Uh, if you're not keeping track, we've had two launches uh, in the span of that time from North Korea that we've had to deal with at the same time. So it, as somebody said, you know, KJU rips one now every now and then. So I, 
um, as part of our mission set. And then finally, and I think uh, the purpose of today's panel, is our theater security cooperation in which we deal uh, with Mexico, with Canada, uh, um, and the Bahamas as well. And I will tell you uh, unequivocally, especially uh, with regard to Mexico, the mill-to-mill -mill relationship uh, that we have is probably the strongest that it's ever been. And uh, it's in large part to the efforts of General Granados and Sedena um, and his counterpart, Admiral Alcalan, who's the uh, CIMAR uh, Chief of Staff. And uh, the three of us have a great relationship. And, and, and then all of our components uh, that work directly with, uh, with the Mexican military. And the relationship there uh, is what's building a stronger North America. And I look forward to having the opportunity to talk about that. Um, let me talk briefly about componency. Uh, General Robinson has uh, uh, pushed uh, the command away from having joint task force for operations and more looking at componency. And you see that in our responses that we've done here uh, to the hurricanes. Uh, we've had a GIFLIC uh, um, uh, in Texas when Harvey hit, and that was uh, General Buchanan was the three-star that we had on the ground. We had the GIFLIC forward was a two-star uh, Brian Harris was his GIFLIC forward, providing support for the governor and, uh, and FEMA uh, and the adjutant general as they provided support and relief uh, in, in Texas and, and in the Houston, Galveston area in particular. Um, as Hurricane Irma came through uh, Florida, we had the same approach. We had a GIFLIC with a three star on the ground, uh, uh, actually back in uh, uh, Fort Sam Houston, but we had a GIFLIC forward and we were supporting again the governor and the TAG and FEMA as we went through Irma. Um, the other part of Irma was uh, in the Virgin Islands, Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands. We had a GIFMIC and Admiral Davidson, the four star admiral, uh, had a fleet down there, uh, the, the Kursage and the Oak Hill. Um, you heard the, uh, the Iwo Jima and the, um, uh, the New York, uh, the aircraft carrier was also down in the Florida Keys in that particular area. And we were providing support from the sea uh, because that was the quickest and easiest way to do it. When Maria started coming, we, uh, we uh, took hurricane avoidance procedures. They went south. As soon as the storm passed, the fleet came back in and was providing uh, support uh, from Navy and Marine Corps primarily into Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands. The transition occurred as uh, both General Kim and General Buchanan came down to Puerto Rico. He's been down there now two weeks um, to work in support of the, the governor of Puerto Rico as well as FEMA and the interagency. I will tell you that the response, and I've been doing uh, a disaster response kind of thing since about 2002. Um, this is by far the best uh, military and interagency response I have ever experienced uh, uh, in terms of how the government has been responding to all four of these now hurricanes with Nate uh, now having gone through uh, the, the Florida Gulf Coast. And I believe uh, it is because the approach that we've taken um, at NORTHCOM with regard to componency um, and, and using the capabilities of all of our components to, together. Uh, the, Air Guard, the Air Force, uh, First Air Force, was providing SAR assets and strate coordinating strategic lift. The Navy has been providing, uh, and the Navy and Marines have been providing air and, uh, and sea-based capabilities to us. They, we brought the Comfort down to Puerto Rico just recently. Uh, the Marines uh, here in the U.S. and the CONUS side has also been very actively engaged on the ground, providing ground support to it. Um, it, uh, it has really been an incredible effort, and I'm happy to talk more about that as we go. Um, and then finally, the partnerships. I think uh, in terms of partnerships, uh, both with Canada and, and Mexico, um, all of our uh, components, the Marines, uh, the Army, uh, the Air Force, have all engaged uh, in, uh, uh, in partnership efforts with Mexico. Um, as well as with Canada. We just did uh, an Arden, big Arden Sentry exercise uh, that looked at some uh, consequence management and had to invo involved uh, a nuclear device that uh, detonated in New York City, well, out just outside the Lincoln Tunnel on the Jersey side. Um, and we did that in partnership with FEMA, but what you may not know is that exercise already had previously started in Canada. And, uh, and so it, the partnerships and the, and the relationships are, are key. And I'll tell you, you know, one of the benefits that comes from that is uh, uh, when Harvey first hit uh, and we were uh, providing relief efforts, one of the first phone calls I got was from Steve. Uh, what can we do? How can we help? 
um, and the Canadians have been a big part of our relief efforts and have been actually flying missions for us down uh, in, uh, uh, in Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands. Um, and, and I think uh, it's the relationships that are developed out of the training and the partnerships and, the, and events like this that um, allow us to do what we do and, and be able to pick up that phone and just call. Um, on the Mexican side, uh, the, same, the same thing. Um, we are able to provide support as necessary uh, in, in response. Um, so we flew a number of uh, uh, relief aircraft down to Mexico following the earthquakes to provide some support and, and, and relief. And it was uh, a very seamless effort. And I think uh, um, uh, that's indicative of the relationships and the partnerships that we build. And then finally, uh, I'll just talk briefly about our J-9 section, which is our interagency section uh, within NORTHCOM. Probably one of the best you'll find in a combatant command. We have uh, over 30 departments and agencies who are full-time residents within our headquarters. And beyond that, we've got reach back uh, to another 30 or so. So we're over 60 departments and agencies that have representation within our headquarters uh, that we can call up at a moment's notice to provide any type of support uh, as we provide um, um, military capability and DOD capability as the synchronizer in support of a lead federal agency. Um, the the interagency group are, uh, has been activated since uh, uh, the first, uh, the last week of August when we stood up everything else in our headquarters and has been going 24-7 just like our operations center. Um, and so it as well has been a great partnership to have those relationships built in advance. And so I think I'll just stop there. Um, I look forward to your questions and uh, thanks for the opportunity to be here, Eric, wherever you are. Thanks, Eric. <laughs> Right on. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure and a privilege to be here with you today. Um, and I'd like to start uh, before I begin my formal remarks and just acknowledge the hard work and collaboration uh, with the United States Forces and uh, particularly the United States Army and the Mexican armies, but also within the context of the joint team and helping the communities that have experienced the devastation ranging from uh, the recent hurricanes um, and the earthquake. Um, in, uh, in Mexico, uh, the Joint Force, uh, we're active in the Caribbean and a number of other areas and it's just something that occurs within uh, uh, minutes if not seconds afterwards that the, the electronic emails start flying and uh, reaching out and uh, bringing SA and uh, options to the table. Um, I'd also like to point out that just, you know, when it comes to, uh, you know, I'm, I'm down in the United States all the time. but. I, I find that um, sometimes it's worth reminding people just how integrated um, our, guy, our economies are in our societies. You know, we're the number one trading partner with over 35 different states in the United States. Um, and every time um, there is a crisis, it invariably touches us, um, not indirectly, but directly. And even in something like the tragedy that occurred in Las Vegas last week, there were at least four Canadians that were killed. And so when you consider the size of the populations and put it into proportion, uh, we grieve with you, very much with you. Um, and I would tell you that, and so it goes for uh, places like uh, Florida and the hurricanes and, and Texas uh, and the like, and through the, the entire uh, Caribbean archipelago, island chains, um, you know, we're very much with them uh, from the get-go on this. Um, I would say I've been asked to give you a, a few remarks on how CAF, how the Canadian Armed Forces meets our defense needs now and into the future within the context of the theme today, but also to touch on the new defense policy that we have, which is called Strong, Secure, Engaged, and how it's impacting our relationship with key allies. So I'll refer to some notes, right? So there's a, my head's down uh, delivering operations on a day-to-day -day basis. There's some policy issues here, and I want to make sure I don't stray outside my lane a little bit on, on a couple of points. but. For those unfamiliar with Canadian geography, um, we're about, say, just give or take, about the same size geographically, uh, but we have one-tenth of the population. So we have an enormous land mass, um, not densely populated. Most Canadians live within 100 miles, something like 85, 90 percent within 100 miles of the U.S. border. The only major city that's kind of outside that range is Edmonton and Alberta. Um, and uh, for us to go from Trenton into the high Arctic, it's an eight-hour flight. So from the Arctic, uh, from a land basis, you know, everything we do, uh, folks on the policy side don't like when I say this, but it's expeditionary in nature from a sustainment basis. Um, and it's an environment where having served in desert uh, environments, the Arctic will kill you faster if you're not prepared, if you're not ready, and you don't know what you're doing. Um, so, you know, when I compare to the density, therefore, we're a much um, less densely populated with a tremendous land mass to provide oversight onto. Um, and for which, um, as we have uh, crises that occur from whether they're fires in British Columbia, 
uh, or other environmental issues across, it's always a question of, uh, of looking to where our assets are and how we project the force. Um, and we also organize regionally, exploiting our, our equivalent of the, of the Army Reserve and the National Guard um, inside our provinces to be able to respond, uh, if not in the first 24 hours, to be able to sustain the immediate response units that we have on high readiness. Um, in 2017, in June, just a few months ago, we uh, recently released Strong, Secure, Engaged, our defense policy, and the title of the document suggests this policy represents uh, uh, a bit of a new vision for defense in Canada. Um, strong at home, military ready and able to defend our sovereignty and to assist in times of natural disasters, support search and rescue and respond to other emergencies. We've got a fair bit of tradition, you know, even in joint operations I have um, um, on, uh, when it comes to air response, we have something that's similar to what the Coast Guard does, so we're involved in search and rescue. My Blackberry pings with every search and rescue event in Canada. Um, every day and uh, so you know the thrust lines going forward as part of strong secure and engage include all elements all domains so secure in North America active in a renewed defense partnership uh, with the United States and key regional allies like Mexico um, and um, like the Jamaican Defense Force that we deployed uh, in our aircraft um, in the Caribbean we are also engaged in the world. Uh, we're doing our part um, in Europe, um, in the Middle East, um, in the Gulf region. Uh, we're in Iraq, part of the coalitions, and we see that uh, as being a continuous uh, theme um, of that engagement going forward. But for CJOC, it's the home game. Defense of Canada, contributing to the defense of North America, it is critically important. Um, it stops all other discussions when we have an event that occurs on our continent. Um, and we focus on what we have in front of us. Our domestic security is linked to and often challenged by sources from abroad as the line between national and international security continues to blur. And the bottom line is that borderless and diffuse threats are challenging our security from halfway around the globe. So in the past, our geography has insulated that, and that's part of the cultural baggage that we bring forward. Uh, we bring this, what well, we live in a fireproof house. We're a long ways from everything. Um, and more and more Canadians, if that's still a thought out there, more and more Canadians are certainly pushing back on that. And we see that natural disasters are increasing both severity and frequency, straining our ability to respond. International criminal organizations and violent extremist organizations continuously find new ways to threaten our security and act regardless of border or jurisdiction. And uh, so simultaneous tradition, nation states, uh, actors so discord and, and exploit that. One of the things that I will tell you that one of the great little epiphanies I've had um, since I came into this command, it was back in June of 15, so I've been in this for two and a half years now, is watching the team under Operation Martello down in the, the Caribbean in Latin America, um, a counter narcotics focus that seems to be a law enforcement led issue, but I think we need to get our heads around the fact that this is truly a national security issue, first, foremost, and always which government department has the lead at a particular time or agency or branch, that's a matter of discussion. However, the reality is we're seeing an alignment, a greater alignment day in, day out between violent extremist organizations, trans criminal organization and malign actors that would exploit that. That means we all have to be partnered to a greater degree moving forward. And this is one of the themes that we've identified as to how we help the whole of government team in Canada, as we call it, other government departments, be more than they can be just in the silo themselves. So sometimes that means how we support them in exercising um, platforms that we do regularly on a joint basis in an international context, but how we actually enable that capacity within our, within our countries. And so it's, uh, it's opening our aperture to the threats that are out there. Um, I will tell you that uh, a number of investments have been laid out, and I won't go in numbers and capabilities and systems here, um, but we do expect that our defense budget will increase over time, and in a very short period we'll be spending more than 30 percent of our budget on new equipment capabilities. We're very proud of that. Um, and so as you begin to look at the metrics that are thrown out about defense expenditures, we have a small military, but it is quite agile. And uh, we seek to increase that agility by focusing on capability acquisition, maintaining the funding that we have towards readiness and training, and then gradually increasing. We have a very small percentage relative to some allies in NATO devoted to personnel costs, and we'll increase those over time, uh, commensurate with the challenge. But a lot of capability is in there for sustaining the capability we have, as well as some big ticket items um, in terms of enhancing our capability, and that's all part of strong, secure, engaged. Um, 
I will tell you though that notwithstanding the big ticket stuff, um, Army combat systems, uh, new frigates, etc., a new fighter aircraft, all that good stuff, um, this new defense policy focuses on um, enhancement of our enabler capability. Building our intelligence um, back to where it was, we, uh, we searched it up through Afghanistan, kind of let it uh, wither a little bit as uh, the defense budget took a, some hits in the last number of years, it needs to be built up again. Um, expanding our ISR uh, capability, particularly um, in uh, the, the uh, continental context, um, as well as um, cyber operations. Um, and uh, we're actually having um, um, a quite a think through about how we defend, and our structures are slightly different than in the United States, as an example, but uh, we're make, making headway in that regard. So really the focus is um, on uh, enablers coming forward, Everything from space, cyber, back through, um, quite a bit of effort will be in that area. Um, you know, we talked about uh, uh, joint activities here, and, uh, and I just want to highlight again uh, uh, that the threats that we see coming at us are um, agnostic. Um, they don't say that, you know, well, I'm primarily by nature a law enforcement issue. They don't care, and therefore we ought not to care in return. And so um, as we move forward and look to build our partnership with our allies, um, you know, I keep coming back to that example of uh, what I see in Jayat of South, and I know there are other examples. This is just one that touches me because we deploy assets in support, but we see law enforcement working alongside military, a variety of law enforcement organizations supported by other government departments in an international context having an effect, a positive effect. And that's what we seek to achieve as part of, a, uh, of uh, our commitment under um, this new policy. Canada and Mexico, too, I, I must say, have a, 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 a maturing and mutually productive relationship that we've established a, a, a regular strategic dialogue. Mexico has been a member of the military training and cooperation program since 2004. Um, training is provided to Mexico, contributes to the professional development of, of all of our officers and, um, and personnel, um, and increases our interoperability. Um, and more than anything else, that interoperability at a human level is one of the most fundamental enablers that we can all bring to the table. At the strategic level, uh, bilateral and trilateral defense relationships are being developed through uh, North American Defense Ministers meeting, which I had the privilege of supporting our minister uh, back in May uh, when it was hosted by Secretary Mattis in uh, the Pentagon um, and the North American Leaders Summit, uh, amongst others. So we're making way there. Uh, but, you know, the U.S., it is our, our premier uh, defense partner, um, and I'd like to just tell you a little anecdote. Um, you know, there's a few Canadians in the room that tend to be concentrated in the back, back there, and, you know, the smattering U.S. personnel, but Admiral Gortney, when he was, uh, a few years ago, uh, when he was commander of NORAD and NORTHCOM, um, he asked the staff to show where the gaps and seams were between Canada and the United States. And they came back to report to say with a little placemat that showed there was no change because the Canadians were everywhere. You should not be surprised that although our numbers are relatively small, we're not stupid, um, and uh, we know where um, to the, the issues, the relationships, and the organizations with which we need to embed in order to further our joint program. And so we have an extensive relationship. It is by far the most important relationship, um, both on a governmental level, but also on a, a broader governmental, but also on a defense level. Um, you know, a couple weeks ago, when I just break it down into uh, um, a theme as an example for us that's uh, hugely important is the Arctic, um, land domain, uh, key, key amongst that. Uh, the U.S. regularly participates in Operation Nanook, um, an annual Arctic exercise conducted by, the, by our forces to demonstrate our sovereignty in the north and project power into the, uh, the high Arctic um, and enhance our interoperability with, uh, with Arctic partners and not just the United States. There are other partners that participate in this with us. Uh, primarily on a safety and security matter, such as search, search and rescue and incident response. And that says the Arctic waters are warming uh, and ice retreating. That is going to become a big issue going forward, um, and the land is ever more exposed. Um, so two, two weeks today uh, ago today, we had our planning conference for next uh, year's iteration with representatives from NORAD, from NORTHCOM, which focused on the ways in which we can expand a joint training exercise um, into the future. That will help inform the renewal of our Arctic campaign plan and the CJOC plan for the North and how we sustain our operations in the North uh, going forward. Um, and I'd just like to say a few more, a few more points. Um, you know, we have uh, a truly unique defense partnership, I've said, um, with embeds across a variety of organizations. 
Um, but there are 160 Canadians that are, that are part of the binational command structure of NORET. Uh, and then we have our LO structure um, with all of the combatant commands. My number one defense relationship is with General Robinson. I cover off all the COCOMs based on where we have operations in the world. Um, but every day in my commander's update briefing, the one we start off with is North America. It's with uh, NORET and NORTHCOM, but it's that focus that we go forward on that. And then we go around the globe. Um, we're obviously, I, you know, I didn't get a chance to talk to General Townsend last night. Wanted to shake his hand again um, on his return. We have Canadians, including a general embedded in his staff. We have folks uh, flying missions out of Kuwait. Um, we have, our, of course, our special forces are, are still in Iraq, and we have folks covering off medical and aviation responsibilities out of Erbil up in, uh, in Kurdistan. So we're embedded in that organization, so we maintain our focus, and that's consistent with uh, our policy moving forward. So let me just uh, sort of wrap it all up uh, by saying just a couple things. These areas of collaboration are emblematic of a strong and healthy relationship that continues to grow um, and flourish, but we may be, must be cautious of complacency that arises from familiarity. This is something we need to work on. We all change positions. Just when we think we've got it figured out, we move on to a new job. We have people cycling in and out, enormous size of your organization, but even in the Canadian context, we are as at once rich by our geography as we are terrorized by it because it's so big, so expansive, and we're so long on a linear basis and we post people from one coast to the other coast um, and everything changes. So these decades old relationships are things that need to be renewed every year. They need to be renewed. What a great venue this is in that way. Um, and we need to work at keeping things fresh. Um, I think the North American defense relation, um, I have staff here, I gotta say this. I have staff that actually wrote this because they think that normally I just read notes um, and then I just talk extemporaneously, um, but they actually wrote this, while I'm partial to pina coladas and getting caught in the rain. How's that? <laughs> <laughs> There's a policy advisor that's gonna have, uh, we're gonna have a little fun with this when I get back. She didn't think I'd read it. <laughs> the North American defense relationship could be better served by looking to refreshing some existing defense plans and uh, looking at ways we can ever address these, uh, this security situation. Uh, recent hurricanes come to mind um, and how we can reset um, the time. You know, we have as a focus in the CGOC that when something happens, we get out the door fast. I'm always going to the chief within a matter of hours, our chief of defense staff, with options for pre-positioning, for accelerating the deployment timelines because we know politics will take a while to work its way out until you get the right authority. So what can we do to position ourselves? We had a frigate on the East Coast that was out training. It didn't have its helicopter, didn't ha wasn't uploaded with supplies. We made the decision within the context of its training mandate to get it back into port, get it uploaded, get it back out to sea training, except for the direction it was going to do its training was slightly different, but all doing its training. And so when the decision came down, we were ready to respond. We need staffs and leaders that are accustomed to doing that, not only on a national basis, but on an international context. Um, and I would actually just want to touch on one because there's something that's very important here. It's mundane, but it is critically important. <clears throat> Document classification and info sharing issues continue to hamper us all the way across the board, everything from intelligence forward, between uh, organizations across. And this is not something just in with the Canada-US relationship. This is in the broader allied context. And we need to ensure that our reflex is no longer need to know, but rather need to share. We've got to figure a way of getting back and being able to classify that which is truly um, um, classified um, because if we're not careful, we'll end up cutting each other out of the loop um, and then withholding and then people's lives are in danger. Finally, um, as we pay more attention to the land domain, Canada has had the virtue of that geographic isolation I talked about. Uh, but as the geographic advantage erodes, we need to put more effort in understanding the threats of the future in the defense of Canada through the relationship building and structural reforms that enable joint action. Um, and things like um, a regional joint task force commanders conference that enhances our, which is an initiative in play, um, coming out of our north, supported by NORTHCOM, that allow us to be able to talk cross-border issues with commanders at the right moment, at the right time. And that'll be a great way for us to get the ball rolling as we look into the next year. So thank you very much. It's been a privilege to chat here. Cheers. Good morning. Si ustedes me lo permiten continuar yo hablando en español.
Can, can you guys turn the mic over there? Is that it went on? Yeah, what I say? Yeah. If you'll allow me, the general says he will uh, continue to his presentation in Spanish. Con el auxilio del señor Leocadio Muñiz del Ejército Norte. With the support of uh, Leocadio Muñiz, myself, from Army North. Primero expreso mi agradecimiento al Estado Mayor del Ejército y al Ejército Norte. First, I express uh, my appreciation to the staff of uh, Army North. Por tener honor de compartir con tan prominentes personas en este panel. For having the honor of uh, sharing uh, the important, this panel with such important persons. Dentro de la reunión anual 2017 de la Asociación del Ejército de los Estados Unidos de América. Within the annual meeting of the AUSA. Traigo un saludo del General Salvador Cienfuegos, Secretario de la Defensa Nacional. I bring a greeting from General Salvador Cienfuegos, the Secretary of National Defense. Para todos los soldados de este gran país y el público que ahora nos acompaña. For all the soldiers of this great country and the public who are with us today. Quisiera en mi exposición hacer una breve semblanza de lo que son las Fuerzas Armadas de México. In my presentation, I'd like to give you a brief description of what the armed forces of Mexico are like. Compartir también algunas cifras qué es México. I'd like to also share a few figures of what is Mexico. Y tratar la relación militar que tenemos con Estados Unidos de América, Canadá y otros países. And to discuss what the relationship is that we have with the U.S., with Canada, and with other countries. México se solidariza con los Estados Unidos de América por el impacto de los huracanes. Mexico joins the, uh, the U.S. Uh, regarding the impact of the recent hurricanes that we've had. Harvey, Irma y María. And they are Harvey, Irma and María. Que afectaron a algunos estados de la Unión Americana y de Puerto Rico which affected uh, some states in the United States as well as Puerto Rico. Agradece también el apoyo que un grupo de expertos en busca de ir rescate. We appreciate also the support that was given by a group of uh, experts in search and rescue. Proporcionaron principalmente en la Ciudad de México a los afectados por los sismos del mes de septiembre which was provided uh, primarily in uh, Mexico City uh, to the people who were affected by the uh, earthquake in September. Las Fuerzas Armadas Mexicanas tienen constitucionalmente constitutionally the uh, armed forces of Mexico asignadas dos misiones que son la defensa nacional y la seguridad interior. They are assigned two missions, which are uh, national defense and internal security. Para este efecto, contamos con 267,000 hombres del Ejército, Fuerza Aérea y Armada. And to carry out this mission, we have 267,000 uh, troops, both are in the Army, Air Force, and Navy. Para cubrir 5 billones de metros cuadrados, de espacio aéreo, terrestre y marítimo. They cover uh, five million uh, uh, square uh, meters of uh, territory, uh, both uh, ground, air, and maritime. De estos son dos billones de superficie continental. Of those, two million are on the continental area. Lo que significa que tenemos un militar por cada 7.3 kilómetros cuadrados. This means we have uh, one soldier for every 7.3 uh, square kilometers. Y con una población de 120 millones de personas. And with a population of 120 million people. Nuestra proporción es de un militar por cada 464 habitantes. And uh, the proportion is one military for every 400 and, uh, 
64 uh, members of the population. Las Fuerzas Armadas ejercemos un gasto de defensa. The armed forces have a defense uh, budget. Del 0.51 del Producto Interno Bruto. Of 0.51% of the gross uh, domestic product. El promedio de seis países latinoamericanos es de 1.5 del Producto Interno Bruto. And the average of uh, uh, six uh, Latin American countries is 1.5% of their GDP. Si tomamos como referente a Colombia, Perú, Ecuador, Argentina, Chile y Brasil. And that's taken into account the following countries, Colombia, Ecuador, Peru, Chile, Argentina, and Brazil. La economía mexicana ocupa el 15 lugar en el mundo. The Mexican economy is the 15th uh, largest economy in the world. Y el cuarto en América. And the fourth in uh, Latin America. Nuestro crecimiento anual es del 2.1%. Our annual uh, growth is 2.1%. Superado solamente por India, China, Estados Unidos, Canadá y España. Uh, which is surpassed only by India, China, the U.S., Canada, and Spain. En comercio internacional, hemos alcanzado el primer lugar de producción. In international commerce, we have achieved the first place in production of. De plata, café y partes de la industria aeroespacial y automotriz. Uh, silver, coffee, uh, and uh, parts of the aerospace industry and automotive industry. También ocupamos el cuarto lugar en vehículos después de Alemania, Corea del Sur y Japón. We also uh, occupy the fourth uh, place in uh, production of vehicles after Germany, South Korea and Japan. El once en ganadería primaria. Uh, eleventh place in uh, primary livestock. Doce en producción de alimentos. 12th place in the production of uh, foodstuff. 13 en cultivos agrícolas. Uh, 13th in agricultural products. Y 16 en industria pesquera y acuícola. And 16th place in uh, the fishing industry. En el presente año se han creado 700,000 empleos. And in the present year we've created 700,000 jobs. Y en total acumulado desde el inicio de, administra de la administración en diciembre de 2012, 3 millones de empleos. And the uh, total uh, accumulation of uh, new jobs since the beginning of this administration in December 2012 has reduciendo been 3 la million. Taza, reduciendo la tasa de desempleo del 5 al 3.5%. Reducing the rate of unemployment from 5 to 3.5%. México entiende que cada estado establece sus prioridades de seguridad. Mexico understands that every state will establish their security priorities. Pero también entendemos que But we also understand that las amenazas multidimensionales demandan una postura integral y decidida. Multiple or er, uh, multidimensional threats uh, demand an integrated posture and a very decisive posture. Identificamos principalmente entre estas. And we identify among these principally. A la delincuencia organizada transnacional. Transnational organized crime. Debido a su capacidad financiera y a la violencia que genera. Due to their uh, financial capacity and the violence that they generate. Conviene tomar medidas de cooperación. It's worth uh, taking uh, cooperative measures. Para evitar los flujos ilícitos de drogas de sur a norte. To avoid the flow of illicit drugs from south to north. Y de armas y dinero de norte a sur. And of weapons and money from north to south. 
en desastres, in the area of natural disasters. Las proyecciones indican la probabilidad de que ocurran con mayor frecuencia. The projections are that uh, they're going to occur with uh, more frequency. Y que su fuerza sea más devastadora. And that their force of destructive force will be more devastating. Pensamos que nuestros países deben preparar modelos de ayuda humanitaria. We think that our countries should develop uh, models for humanitarian assistance. De prevención, auxilio y recuperación más eficientes. Deal, uh, which are more efficient in uh, prevention, uh, oper actual operations and recovery. Respecto al terrorismo, with regards to terrorism, aun cuando las organizaciones extremistas no han manifestado intenciones de actuar en México, even when the extremist organizations haven't uh, demonstrated uh, a willingness to operate in Mexico, tenemos interés y compromiso para cooperar en esta materia. We have interest and a commitment to cooperate in this area as well. Sobre los ataques cibernéticos, and regarding cyber attacks, sabemos que pueden ocasionar trastornos de grandes consecuencias. We know they can cause uh, great consequences or uh, setbacks with great consequences. En las comunicaciones, la economía y la, y la infraestructura estratégica. Dealing with communications, the economy and the strategic infrastructure. México reconoce la complejidad de contrarrestar las intenciones. Mexico recognizes the complexity of countering the intentions. Y capacidades de adversarios potenciales. And the capacities of uh, potential adversaries. Comprendemos que la responsabilidad compartida. We understand that the uh, shared responsibility, la coordinación y cooperación con otros estados, uh, coordination and cooperation with other countries, son las mejores formas de atender las amenazas, are the best way to uh, deal with the threats. Siempre respetando la soberanía de cada país. But always keeping in mind and respecting the sovereignty of each country. Compartimos con Estados Unidos de América y Canadá. We share with the U.S. and uh, Canada. Intereses económicos, sociales, de seguridad y de defensa. Economic, social, security and defense interests. Por lo que asumimos nuestra responsabilidad en el área de Norteamérica. Which is why we assume our responsibility in the uh, region of North America. Región que concentra más de 500 millones de habitantes. Which is a region that has more than 500 million uh, population. Y que su economía es más grande que la de Europa en su conjunto. And whose economy surpasses that of uh, Europe in its entirety. Su seguridad es para México y para sus fuerzas armadas una alta prioridad. Security is for Mexico and its armed forces a very high priority. Requiriendo de una sinergia para alcanzar niveles que garanticen un bienestar general. It requires a synergy to be able to guarantee a general well-being. Ante esto, México no es un sujeto pasivo. And uh, faced with this, Mexico is not uh, passive. Asume un papel proactivo y decidido en la construcción de su futuro. It assumes a proactive and decisive uh, role in the construction of its future. A México le interesa ser vecino estable y seguro. And Mexico is interested in being a stable and secure neighbor. Nuestro presidente fijó dentro de sus cinco grandes metas our president uh, mentioned within his uh, five main goals un méxico con responsabilidad global a mexico with uh, global responsibilities para esto trabajamos for this we work en el sistema 
hemisférico de seguridad encabezado por la Organización de Estados Americanos. In the hemispheric uh, security system which is uh, headed by the OAS. A través de la Junta Interamericana de Defensa. And uh, also uh, through the Inter-American Defense uh, Board. En el Colegio Interamericano de Defensa. As well in the Inter-American Defense College. La Secretaría General. The uh, Secretary General. Y el Consejo de Delegados que actualmente preside un general mexicano. And the Council of Delegates, uh, which is currently uh, headed by a Mexican uh, general. Importantes mecanismos son también los siguientes. Other important uh, mechanisms uh, follow. En primer lugar, la reunión trilateral de ministros de defensa de América del Norte. In first place, as the uh, trilateral uh, meeting of the ministers of defense of North America. Que ha permitido incrementar la cooperación y dinamismo. Which has uh, permitted us to increase cooperation and uh, dynamic activity. En asuntos de defensa y desafíos comunes. In the areas of defense and uh, common threats. Or challenges. La Conferencia de Ministros de Defensa de las Américas. The Conference of the uh, Ministers of Defense of North America. En donde México ejerce la presidencia 2017-2018. In which uh, Mexico will serve as a chair for 2017-2018. Deseo informar también que. I'd also like to inform you that. De manera coordinada con los comandos norte y sur de los Estados Unidos de América. In a coordinated fashion with uh, Northern Command and Southern Command. Realizamos en este año. En Cozumel, Quintana Roo, we carried out this year in Cozumel, Quintana Roo, la Conferencia de Seguridad de Centro América, the uh, Conference of Security for Central America, y reconociendo la importancia de la contribución de las conferencias militares hemisféricas, and uh, recognizing the importance of the contributions of the uh, military conferences, de 2012 a 2013. Se ejerció la presidencia de la Conferencia de Ejércitos Americanos. From 2012 to 2013, Mexico uh, had the presidency of the Conference of American Armies. Y en 2015, la de Jefes de Fuerzas Aéreas Americanas. And in 2015, uh, the chair of the uh, chiefs of uh, the chiefs of staff of the Air Forces of uh, Latin America. También en 2015. Fuimos aceptados como país observador en la Conferencia de Fuerzas Armadas Centroamericanas. In 2015, we were also accepted as an observer uh, country in the Conference of the uh, Central American Armed Forces. Y es nuestra, nuestra intención próximamente actuar como miembro pleno. And uh, we have the intention of uh, becoming a full member. Hemos organizado Reuniones de Estados Mayores. We've organized meetings of the staffs. Con los Estados Unidos de América en dos niveles. With the U.S. at two different levels. Con Canadá. With Canada. Guatemala y otros países americanos y europeos. With uh, Guatemala and other, uh, Canada, Guatemala and other uh, European countries. También juntas de comandantes fronterizos. We also have uh, border commanders conferences. Con Estados Unidos de América, Belice y Guatemala. With the uh, U.S., Belize and Guatemala. La participación bilateral con Centroamérica se ha incrementado. Bilateral participation with Central America has also grown. En donde atendemos a la problemática transnacional where we uh, are focused on the transnational uh, situation or problems. Y se coopera en proyectos de integración, desarrollo y seguridad. And we cooperate in projects of uh, cooperation and integration, development and security. Históricamente, México ha sido promotor de la paz mundial. Historically, uh, Mexico has been a promoter of uh, world peace. Comenzamos la participación en operaciones de las Naciones Unidas en 1949. 
we started participation in the, the UN's peacekeeping operations in 1949. Y por razones nacionales se suspendieron. And uh, due to uh, national uh, reasons, they were suspended. Reanudando en 2014. And we started them up again in 2014. Para lo que hemos eh, desarrollado una estrategia general. And we've developed a general strategy for it. Para que gradualmente haya esta reinserción de las Fuerzas Armadas Mexicanas. So that gradually we will reinsert uh, Mexican armed forces. Este es un tema trascendental de seguridad mundial. This is a uh, transcendental uh, problem of, of the world security. México seguirá asignándole el nivel de importancia. Mexico will continue to uh, see this as a very important. Que requieren estas eh, relaciones políticas estratégicas. Which require uh, decisions at the political and strategic level. Para la seguridad de nuestras fronteras, for realizamos this, ejercicios conjuntos con Estados Unidos de América. For the security of our borders, we exercise uh, uh, joint exercises with the U.S. Ejemplifico tres. I'll give an example of three here. Para vuelos ilícitos, la operación Amalgam Eagle. Dealing with uh, illicit flights, so we have uh, Operation Amalgam Eagle. Para contingencias ambientales, la operación Vibran Response. For uh, natural uh, disasters or environmental contingencies, we have Vibrant Response. Y para asistencia humanitaria y auxilio en caso de desastres, el Ardent Sentry. And for humanitarian assistance and support in case of natural disasters, we have an ardent sentry. Con Belice y Guatemala, hemos estrechado la coordinación en el desarrollo de operaciones coincidentes. With Belize and Guatemala, we have a, a coordination, more t uh, <clears throat> better coordination with uh, Belize and Guatemala in the area of coincidental operations. Cada fuerza en su propio territorio. With each force in their own territory, on their own side of the border. Y en el marco de las reuniones de comandantes fronterizos que ya mencioné. And in the area of uh, border commanders conferences, which I've already mentioned. Realizamos juntas locales de coordinación. We uh, carry out uh, local coordination meetings. Cuando son en nuestra frontera norte, when they are on our northern border, tenemos la muy productiva participación de el Homeland Security, Homeland Security. Así es. When we have them on our northern border, they have the very cooperative uh, participation of Homeland Security. Representado por CBP. Uh, represented by CBP, Customs and Border Protection. Con Guatemala realizamos ejercicios de intercepción aérea virtual. And uh, with Guatemala we carry out uh, exercises that deal with uh, uh, air, virtual air intercepts. Y visitas recíprocas de mando y control. And reciprocal visits dealing with command and control. Con el resto de Centroamérica, además de los mecanismos ya mencionados. With the rest of Central America, in addition to the mechanisms that have already been mentioned. Participamos en los grupos de alto nivel para la seguridad. We uh, participate in the high level groups for security. Finalmente quiero expresar la excelente coordinación que a nivel estratégico y operacional. And finally I want to express the excellent uh, cooperation at the uh, strategic and operational level. Tiene el Estado Mayor de la Defensa Nacional de México that the uh, general staff of the defense of Mexico con los comandos norte y sur de los Estados Unidos de América has with the US northern and US southern commands y con el comando canadiense de operaciones conjuntas and with the uh, CJOC of Canada agradeciendo su comprensión por esta exposición tan larga we uh, appreciate your uh, understanding for this very long uh, exposition Doy fin a esta presentación. I conclude this presentation. Thank, Thank you very much.
you very much. Um, first of all, this is working. Can you hear me? Oh. Let me make sure it's right. Can you hear me now? Okay, there we go. Much better. Well, first of all, it's a real privilege and an honor for me to be here with such a distinguished panel. Uh, what you can see here is a representation of what is truly joint, combined, and interagency, which is the way that we do business in this hemisphere. And I think what I want to do is just kind of give you a, a brief overview of how we fit within the scheme of defending the United States. So if you look at the United States as, as priority one for the Defense Department, I think we all can agree that each one of us here has as their first priority their own, the defense of their own homeland, their own country. So comparatively speaking, uh, if you look at the Western Hemisphere, uh, you have uh, a much more peaceful half of the world. Uh, just to put it into context, uh, the way that we're divided in the Department of Defense uh, in uh, DASD ships or the uh, uh, Deputy Assistant Secretaries of Defense, we have eight. One for this hemisphere and seven for the others. So that can kind of give you a general idea of, of, of where uh, the Defense Department has a lot of its focus. That said, however, when we had the, the recent North American Defense Ministerial, it was very clear from Secretary of Defense Manus that priority one is here. And it's, and it's here for a reason. Uh, we have to collectively look at how we defend uh, our own homeland and our, our own continent. And, and this continent is represented here today. Uh, and we do that uh, by looking at, in contrast with the other hemisphere, where you do not in this continent have the millennial long conflicts that they have in the other. Uh, if you just start looking, you know, just you can just go by region. You can look at, you can start with, with Russia, you can look at China, you can look at Korea, you can look at Iran, you can look at the ongoing conflicts right now uh, within <clears throat> uh, Syria, and then add to that some of the many challenges faced by Africa and its whole complement of nations, we don't have those kind of conflicts in this hemisphere. So we can build from that, and the way that we do that is we have a, a framework that we follow on, on how we approach the hemisphere. The way that we view um, that particular framework is that we look at a hemisphere, we work toward a hemisphere that is collaborative, prosperous and secure. And we do that by re-engaging, or by, by first of all strengthening the partnerships and, and, and uh, coalitions that we have with our partner nations. We re-engage with partners and friends. And then we also inform those adversaries that would wish to cause us harm that there's consequences for those types of actions. And the way that you go about doing that is, is you, you do it by sharing information, by working collaboratively in exercises that prepare us for any potential eventuality that would uh, face us against uh, all adversaries. Um, and, and that information sharing is done through, through the way that you interact with each other in a positive way, as, as you've, you've seen described here in this panel. You know, one of the beauties of being toward the end of, of this, this conference is that everybody's already mentioned the things that you wanted to mention, so uh, you have to shape things a little bit differently in the way that you present your information. But we're all about exchanging information, and, and the way that you share that information is you establish the mechanisms to be able to do that. And you share the information within the environment that you're operating in. And when we talk about the operational environment, uh, it takes an ever-growing uh, set of factors. Uh, and the way that we view the environment is you have to take a look at space, you have to take a look at the air, you have to take a look at the ground, and in many cases, you have to take a look underneath that ground as uh, you know, the bad guys are constantly coming up with ways to exploit even uh, subterranean uh, factors to, to move from one, one place to another. 
you also have to take into consideration the sea and then what's under the water. And then all of that is wrapped in cyber. So to look at, to be situationally aware of that environment requires all of us to have good situational awareness on each and every one of our environments. Now obviously the first priority is by each nation taking care of their own environment, but then to the extent possible, uh, we have to look at how do we share some of that information. Uh, in the Northern Hemisphere, with our neighbors and uh, to the north with Canada and, and then to the south with Mexico, um, we're pretty good at sharing uh, as much as we can and that's what gives us a greater strength. And that would be uh, an easier problem set to solve except that we still have to remember that the other hemisphere has a lot of threats emanating from it. Uh, one, of the, one of the unique qualities of this hemisphere is if you take a look at the globe from the top down and I stole one of the maps from NORTHCOM when I was there because they give you a really good appreciation for the orientation that you really have to look at the world if you're going to defend North America. And you have to look at the globe from the top down. And Canadians are very aware of that battle space as it was described previously because if you look at the furthest distance between Russia and, and Canada, the furthest, is about 2,000 miles. Correct me if I'm mistaken on, on, that, on that distance, but a lot of distances are a lot less. And one of the things that is unique about that is if you take a look at that globe, you can also see that, uh, and, and sailors always tell me this, you know, you Army guys are always looking at the closest distance between uh, two points is a line. And, and most people, and then the Air Force told me that they look at it the same way as the Navy. But anyway, the bottom line is that the closest point, uh, or the closest distance between two points is a curve. Because if you look at a globe, it's actually a curved line. And when you look, take a, a look at the trajectory of something that emanates from a place like Korea, and then lands somewhere uh, within the United States, you know, starting with Canada, it's not a very far distance. So all of these things that we keep hearing about Korea menacing us with different threats from missile systems, you can quickly figure out that it's not a very far distance. And the more they develop that technology, the greater the threat. So exchanging that information becomes critical. And that's, that's the, the wonders and the beauty of the relationship that we've had Canada, with, with Canada for a long time because obviously the biggest threat to the United States is WMD because it's the one that can cause the greatest damage. And I would argue that the greatest threat that uh, we have within our inventory for any country. So having that relationship where we can share the information of what potential things can come at you uh, from afar is very important. And the change in technologies that are involved in that process make it an even greater threat because we're finding that the ability of the enemy to be able to adapt to that environment is getting, uh, is, is getting shorter. So the time spans that you had before are significantly less predictable and they're a lot shorter. So we have to constantly have that dialogue with, with Canada. So it's, it's a different kind of a, of a threat environment when you start looking at what can come at us from the other hemisphere. And if you extend that mindset into something like cyber, it doesn't matter where you are. You know, the cyber environment is one that somebody in his pajamas in a basement that knows how to deal with computers can be a threat, can be a national threat. You know, and, and a lot of that has to do with, you know, we talk about information exchanges. Well, you also have to put in place the appropriate mechanisms to be able to guard that information. Uh, you can look at any day that there's always uh, all sorts of stories. If you listen to the news this morning as I was driving into work, they were talking about plans that were made public uh, by the Koreans. Uh, that kind of information leak can be very detrimental if you're, if you're trying to keep certain things uh, within the proper context and, and the proper ability to share them. So these are some of the things that we look at if you're starting to look at the threat process from um, the perspective of attacking us uh, from, from over the horizon in North America or in, in the cyberspace. When we start looking at, 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 uh, at the hemisphere, you know, it's not only North America, it's also South America. And, and again, the way that we confront those threats is, as you see in this panel here, it's, it's, it's a joint combined in interagency efforts, international effort. 
a lot of the things that come that affect our societies in this hemisphere um, aren't necessarily military, but they do have a military component because we have to provide that defense support to civil authorities, as we mentioned previously. Not only are we concerned with national defense, but we also have to be concerned about what kinds of threats involve defense support to civil authorities, and drugs is one of those big ones. Um, I, I, I've heard, I used to listen to uh, General Kelly when he was a commander of SOUTHCOM, and one of the things that, that, that I was well aware of what he said was that there's 40,000 Americans that die to drug-related incidents on a yearly basis. This would have been about when he was the combatant commander. If you look at those statistics today, we're up to 59,000. Now, what, what do we have to do with all of that? Well, we, we provide support to law enforcement agencies to figure out how we can curb that. 59,000 is not a good number, and it keeps growing, uh, and it affects us here, and those drugs come from uh, throughout the hemisphere, and those drugs feed into other things that have a direct impact on the things that we do. For example, uh, some of these drug cartels are now involved in illegal gold mining. If you look at, at, at South America, uh, many of the illegal gold miners are also affiliated with some of these drug cartels. So when we start talking about threats that come from networks, that's, that's what we're discussing. And in many cases, the money that the, that the illegal gold mining generates is more than drugs but it's all tied together. And just because it's drug traffickers and, and illegal gold miners tied into this loop, it doesn't mean that people that want to cause us harm aren't taking advantage of some of that money. Because you can closely, if you want to see a, a, a classical nexus between uh, those kinds of threats, just look at the, at the activities of the FARC. Uh, they were involved in, in all of those illicit activities. They've come to the peace table. But a lot of the people that did that business before are still out there and they're continuing with their activities. And when you start looking at the numbers, you still have to worry about what it is that that means. Now, to be able to mitigate that, one of the things that, that, that I believe that General Granados talked about was uh, Mexico's cooperation in that regard. Uh, we, we had the um, Security and Prosperity Workshop or conference in Miami where Mexico brought up three of their secretaries. We had three of our secretaries, and it was headed up by the vice president. But it wasn't about Mexico and the United States. It's about how do we assist Central America to confront some of the threats that they face. So to Mexico's southern borders, you have the challenges that are faced by uh, some of the, the limited capabilities that the Central American countries have. So Mexico has been a, a solid partner in providing some of the in, in providing the leadership and providing some of their capabilities so that Central American nations can strengthen their own institutions so that they can confront some of these threats that we face to the south. Um, I, I want to wrap this up because I want to leave some time for the for uh, Director Vitello. Um, but we are partners. We're friends. We live in a hemisphere that is primarily focus on, on prosperity. If you look at most of the time and energy spent by our collective governments, it's not what it is on the other side of the, of the globe. So we want to be able to maintain it and be able to strengthen some of those ties and friendships. So uh, thank you very much, and I pass the, uh, you know, on to Chief Attell. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm honored to be here on this panel and uh, really want to, again, welcome our partners from Canada and Mexico, and uh, forcefully concur with General Hoover's description of the interagency response uh, to these hurricanes. Uh, just a brief anecdote, CBP uh, has about 800 people in the region that was uh, directly affected by Maria, 800 near Puerto Rico, and we needed to get our aircraft to the, the area. Uh, it would take us normally two days, but with a little help from DOD. We were able to get them in, into theater in a five-hour airplane flight, so really do want to uh, concur on the, the quality of the interagency response uh, for these events. I'll give you a little brief uh, overview of CBP activities as it relates to the hemisphere.
talk a little bit about a couple of things that I want to highlight on behalf of the organization and then uh, quickly get into how we cooperate with Mexico and Canada on binational initiatives as it relates to the work that CBP does. Remembering that I'm a CBP per person and a, and a Board of Patrol agent for many years, um, but this is really part of the department and, and the, the Homeland Security, Homeland Defense uh, apparatus within the United States. There are nearly six, 60,000 employees on the ground, air, and water, and CBP is one of the world's largest law enforcement organizations and certainly the largest in the United States. We not only seize drugs, weapons, we also confiscate <laughs> fraudulent documents, counterfeit products, and merchandise, enforcing nearly 500 U.S. trade laws for 47 other federal agencies. In fiscal year 2016, we collected about $40 billion in duties, taxes, and other fees. Um, and then the, the budget, yearly budget for CBP is around $13 billion, so a good return on the investment there. Uh, CBP processed more than a million passengers and pedestrians and more than 74,000 truck, rail, and sea containers into the U.S. Um, in a typical day in 2016, we made more than 1,100 apprehensions, arrested 22 wanted criminals, and seized four tons of narcotics, $30,000 uh, of unreported or illicit currency, and $4 million worth of counterfeit products, and approximately 400 agricultural pests stopped at U.S. ports of entry. CBP works closely with state, local, tribal, and international law enforcement, and that collaboration is important because our mission is remarkably complex. Our current challenges, CBP uh, is working uh, diligently in the interagency on counter networks uh, and transnational criminal organizations, understanding uh, that by forming a counter network division, partnering with state, local, tribal, and federal, and international partners focused on foreign fighter travel, and special interest aliens inbound to the hemisphere, gathering as much information as we can, strengthening our ties with the intelligence community and our international partners. CBP employs a risk-based analysis of incoming and exiting people and cargo at the National Targeting Center, where we identify, screen, and segment low versus high-risk traffic, passengers, and cargo in all transportation modes. Also focused on illegal migration and human trafficking using technologies like biometrics, soliciting designs for border wall and infrastructure, and disrupting the flow of dangerous drugs like opioids, including fentanyl and its analogs into the U.S. Uh, work on well, wall prototypes is underway now uh, near San Diego, and uh, there'll be more to come as we make those requests and identify that requirement. Uh, along with that uh, executive order that directed that planning, uh, President Trump also issued an executive order to hire 5,000 more Border Patrol agents at CBP and 500 additional Air and Marine. Uh, we also must fill existing gaps with our uh, mission support infrastructure and stabilize the workforce uh, at the Office of Field Operations, our customs officers. So a plug for our hiring, cbp.gov, the career page. Um, about 25% of the workforce moving toward, you know, moving upward are veterans uh, in, in the workforce. So uh, please, if you know people who are interested uh, in continuing to serve or want to serve uh, the country, CBP is a great place to do it. Um, we've held about 2,500 recruitment events across the country in the last year. Uh, and I'm getting a little bit smarter about how we use data and analytics to find the right people uh, to come into the organization, but it is challenging, at least in, inside of the Border Patrol. We are failing to uh, hire people as fa fa faster than we lose them, but uh, a lot of work in that, and uh, again, DOD is a, is a good partner in, in being able to uh, use the transition of, uh, of military personnel out of their, their, their service into uh, CBP service. Uh, we're working quite a bit, and I saw it's on the agenda here for the conference. Um, on officer and agent resiliency. Uh, we can't do our mission if our people are not prepared. Uh, these storms and their effect on employees is an example. Officers and agents experience emotional and psychological trauma as, the, as a result of some of the work they do and things that they see. Uh, and it's compounded by life, life's pressures and financial, marital, and family difficulties. Our frontline, person, our, our frontline personnel often serve in remote, uh, desolate locations and face all kinds of dangers. CBP established a national resiliency task force to focus on short and long range strategies for increasing resiliency. It's part of a broader campaign that includes suicide prevention, retirement and ben benefit counseling, chaplains, peer support, mentoring and health and wellness. On the international side, our collaborations with Canada and Mexico, we share more than borders, we share deep economic and cultural ties, as well as a shared commitment to democratic principles. Examples of the trilateral 
uh, and bilateral cooperation, and cooperation include the FAST program, free and secure trade, a commercial current clearance, cargo clearance program for low risk shipments entering the United States from Canada and Mexico. Initiated after 9-11, this innovative trusted traveler shipper program allows expedited processing for commercial carriers who have completed background checks and fulfill certain eligibility. Uh, enrollment is open to truck drivers from the United States, Canada, and Mexico. The North American Single Window Working Group, which is the computer uh, process for automated commercial environment, what we call ACE, so a single window for filing uh, entry documents for cargo into the United States, and the Trilateral Trusted Traveler uh, Agreement, which was signed by uh, Canada and Mexico in 2015. Uh, with regard to Canada, uh, our law enforcement cooperation on radio interoperability, Operation Project North Star, our domain awareness, uh, CBP has just completed its gap analysis and looks forward to the RCMP's equivalent. Uh, we're establishing a northern border coordination center near Detroit, uh, which will be a central uh, bilateral intake and coordination center to address emerging threats uh, with regard to counterterrorism and uh, transnational criminal organizations near the northern border. And then our cross-border law enforcement advisory committee and the tried and true integrated border enforcement teams. Our collaboration frameworks are beyond the border action plan, which was developed in 2011. And there are 32 separate initiatives divided into four areas of cooperation with Canada. Addressing threats early, trade facilitation and economic job growth, cross-border law enforcement, and critical infrastructure and cyber, cyber security. In the end of 2014, U.S. and Canada reaffirmed commitment to continuing to work on the deliverables. Uh, no timeline, but we are urgently moving forward as funding is a, is a consideration in 2018. Uh, CBP and CBSA specifically leverages the Beyond the Border accomplishments and provides agencies with a path forward to establish new priorities and joint governance intended to facilitate the agency's objective of modernizing uh, the border, working together to mitigate threats and identify unfolding opportunities. Our last meeting was in September in Montreal and uh, the goal to reopen that relationship and that dialogue with CBA, CBSA outside of the confines of the bond, beyond the border. And it's a great opportunity for frank operational discussions on topics of mutual interest. As it relates to information sharing, the National Targeting Center Liaison Program, uh, CBSA uh, participates in liaison officers at the National Targeting Center here in Reston. And then uh, two of the, the liaison officers are in place there now. Uh, Tip-off, the United States and Canada have worked to update the 1997 tip-off or the Tuscan arrangement to share known and suspected terrorist information and update address key DHS tasks including reciprocity, inclusion of Canadian citizen data and a for, foreign fighter indicator and expanding to all relevant agencies. On the Travelers program, uh, uh, the Nexus program with CBP and CBBS have been working together to optimal an optimal fee structure to fully fund the program. Uh, we're working on pre-clearance and ongoing pre-clearance in Canada continues in the electronic travel authorization uh, working group with DHS to develop a mechanism in which Canada would screen visa exempt travelers, including Mexican nationals, against U.S. derogatory da data. Enhanced screening for visas at ports of entry, CBP and CBSA committed to work together to develop an enhanced and harmonized approach to traveler screening and identify and interdict persons who pose a threat at the border. And we're also working on pilot programs uh, in the cargo environment for rail and then truck manifests. With regard to Mexico, we're working with Samar to disrupt transnational criminal organizations, stop illicit flows of inbound drugs, stopping outbound money and weapons, and combating human trafficking. Uh, we're also working with uh, the Tax Administration, SAT, on uh, intellectual property rights and uh, joint investigations as it relates to import safety and collaboration, consumer product safety. We've recently signed an MOU with SAT with, with regard to the, uh, that assistance. Collaboration between uh, the National Targeting Center as with Canada, we're using electronic data and sharing electronic data with the customs group in Mexico. Uh, the Trusted Traveler program with Mexico is known as Sentry, Secure Electronic Network for Travelers for Rapid Inspection. Travelers pre-approved for Sentry, all applicants undergo a rigorous background. And then we're working on 
preclearance with as Mexico City uh, as the next uh, iteration for preclearance of travelers inbound from, from Mexico uh, when the new airport is up and running. We're also harmonizing data as it relates to cargo programs and doing unified cargo processing in which CBP and, and SAT jointly examine cargo at five major ports of entry uh, along the southern border. As an example, in Arizona, this reduced the wait times for cargo coming into the United States uh, by 75 percent. It's an enhanced uh, national security for both the U.S. and Mexico. And the next uh, unified cargo processing will be at Otay Mesa in, uh, near, near San Diego. I want to thank the panels and, and thanks for uh, being allowed to share with you today. We share the same goals, efficient and effective border security that prevents the entry and movement of unlawful illicit people and goods while facilitating the entry and movement of missile cargoes and travelers. As the world's first totally integrated border security agency, combining customs, immigration, and agriculture inspections, as well as border management functions, CBP offers unique perspective. We are ready to share, we're ready to help, and we are confident that there is a reciprocal readiness amongst each of you to commit to the required resources that, to share a law enforcement effort. Thank you, and we look forward to the questions and the discussion going forward. Join me in thank well, thanking our panelists. Thank you all very much, and I confess that as a researcher and a student of these relationships, I must have two dozen questions I'd like to ask, pose to each one of you, and clearly we don't have time for that sort of thing. Uh, our time runs out here in about half hour, and I promise to let uh, people in the audience to uh, raise some questions as well. But let me do it this way, instead of going and asking different questions to each one of you. I'd like to ask two or three questions that each one of you can respond to. Uh, and, uh, and if you, you know, want to answer one or two of those, that's fine. But I, I guess the, the questions are this. Um, we've heard a lot about improving uh, relationships and, and cooperations cooperation between the three countries and between the agencies and, and, and so on, and that's, that's really important. But the question is, what has enabled that? What, what has, why, how has that happened? It doesn't just happen automatically. What are the components that led to that from your particular perspective? I think the second thing is, what is the value added of that increased cooperation. Uh, I know we've talked about increased security for North America. That's a, obviously a value added, real positive. But are there particular things you want to point to that uh, have been a value added uh, to the Canadian forces, to US forces, to CBP, to DOD? Are there particular success areas that are, are come out of that experience? And the third is, looking forward, where do you think the emphasis should be? Should we continue on the track we're on, more of the same, we're good at going in a good direction? Or are there areas where we need to l reach and look out to? Cyber was mentioned, other things have been mentioned. So I wonder if I could just ask each panelist to respond to one, two, three of those quickly uh, and go down the list. We'll start again with General Hoover and go through as we, we, we did the panel. It's presentation. awful to have to be the first guy to start. <laughs> but I can <laughs> well, you be the shortest yeah. and then leave it to everybody okay. else. So. Fair enough, fair enough. No, no, thanks. So uh, I think quickly, um, uh, I don't remember all your questions, but maybe I'll get to them. Um, I think first of all, it's uh, our exercise program that we have uh, developed over the last several years uh, with the Department of Homeland Security, uh, with the Canadian Forces, with the Mexicans, uh, with the interagency in general, has really re led us to uh, stronger relationships, which then get us to uh, better readiness, which then gets us to a, a more secure uh, North America. So I think that's the first part, and I think that's what's driven us. I think. Uh, it, um, and General Sanfuegos, uh, I'm sorry, General Granados uh, mentioned a, a number of the exercises that Mexico's been involved in. I think General Bowles has mentioned some exercises that we've jointly been involved in. That then leads to, I think, uh, what Steve talked about earlier in terms of the information sharing and the quality of information that we are sharing between our two, between our, our three countries, uh, between the interagency, uh, between our intelligence communities within the, the 
the department within the uh, within the federal government as well as uh, between our countries as well and that information sharing then I think gets you to again a stronger uh, North America in general um, it helps us illuminate the networks and the pathways for illicit trafficking um, to combat the drug issues to combat uh, counterterrorism issues um, and work collectively and then I think at the end of the day um, it comes down to as well relationships personal relationships uh, at the mill to mill level that has really driven us again to I think the, re the relationship building uh, which leads to readiness which I think leads it to a stronger North America. Great. Thank you. General Bowes? We are um, every one of us uh, prisoners of our own experience and, uh, and we bring through our career fields a set of uh, values and approaches that have been limited in many respects, enhanced perhaps, but limited by, by those experiences. And so I have found that, the, um, and, uh, and as I watch uh, junior officers developing now, um, the more that we're able to expose them to um, other cultures, and when I'm talking cultures outside the military, um, I'm not just talking, uh, you know, other nations. I'm also talking within the, the whole of government, cross-departmental. It's the culture as, as the way that you think, the way that you approach problem solving. And what I have found uh, is that some of the success we're enjoying in operations today is the byproduct of, of 15 years. And, you know, and we could all roll back the clock and perhaps wish we didn't have to do that, but we have done that. We had to do that, um, but now let's recognize that there are some advantages to be accrued out of this, is that we have worked together in far-flung places of the world um, on problem sets that weren't necessarily part of what we were initially trained to do, um, and it has put us in good stead. I think it puts us in a, in a light where uh, our, in our leadership looks at it when we talk interoperability. I remember in NATO in the early part of my career, we were talking interoperability, and I always had a technological thrust. And today, interoperability has a people thrust first. It's whether people can work together to solve the problems. And, um, and so that's become very important. And, uh, and, you know, and to feed off of uh, uh, General Hoover's comment, you know, the, the, on, on a domestic and continental basis, the exercises that we have have actually, um, it's the planning, it's not just the sessions uh, you know, that we get together with the senior leadership, but it's the work that the staffs have been doing ahead of time to get us there that when stuff has happened, you know, I, I'm, never, I'm never surprised and always pleased at the level of communication that's always started in well in advance of something because people know one another and more importantly know how to talk to one another. I have a, a briefing coming up to our staff colleges and, and one of the things that I will I'll point to them is that they have to learn to speak other languages and I mean um, even English. <laughs> right? They have to learn, you know, um, they have to learn, um, and this is a bit of a joke, but, um, you know, I had a, a, a cyber operator talk to me one day and says, what do we need to advance cyber? I said, well, first thing we got to do is teach you to speak English. Um, because if you can't get in the mind of your commander to make them, uh, you know, a useful uh, voice for you, uh, if you're going to make it so complex that we can't, uh, you know, get there. Um, so, but it's that interoperability of people, and, um, and I really think that we have um, um, great examples of success recently, but we not, ought not to be uh, complacent in that regard, and we've got to figure out ways that we can continue that, because um, um, I, I don't believe in things like, yeah, I hear it, um, Steph say, irreversible momentum. I just don't accept that. It, it's not irreversible, and it has to be worked on every day. Thank you. Great. Thank you. General Granados. Gracias. Me parece que uno de los componentes para el mejoramiento de nuestras relaciones. Uh, one of the important components to improve our relationships. Ha sido la determinación de nuestros líderes este, manifestada a través de la reunión trilateral de ministros de defensa de América del Norte. Has been the determination uh, that's been uh, manifested by our leaders at the trilateral uh, North American Defense Ministerial. En donde ya ha habido tres reuniones, una en cada este, sede, cada sede de los países participantes. We've already had uh, a meeting in each of the uh, participating countries. Hay un consenso en la evaluación de amenazas. There's a consensus on the evaluation of the threat. Y eso ha generado políticas que nos han permitido 
identificar muy buen muy bien nuestra relación militar bilateral y trilateral and uh, that's allowed us to uh, work out our bilateral and trilateral relationship better es importante seguir sobre este camino que por el nivel que representa we have to con it's important to continue on this path because of the level that it represents nos facilita mucho en el ámbito operacional y táctico it uh, facilitates our operations at the both operational and uh, tactical level. Como lo señalan también este, los señores generales. As uh, my fellow generals here also mentioned. Thank you. Thank you. Before uh, Mr. De La Pena, I just want to remind folks that you'll have a chance here to ask questions. If you want to queue up at the mics, go right ahead and I'll call on people when we're, we're through this round. Uh, I think I'd like to approach this more from a historical perspective. If you look at the relationship, uh, you have to look at the results. Um, and let's start. Let, let's start with the with the the relationship. Uh, the relationship between, for example, the United States and Mexico has been has has gone through through different phases. But if you just let's start from World War II, uh, one of the greatest contributions that Mexico made during World War II was. Uh, allowing 200, roughly about a quarter of a million Mexican citizens, which were legal residents of the United States, to participate in World War II. So Mexico provided roughly a quarter of a million people to fight in World War II. There was also a squadron uh, that fought in the, in the Philippines of, of, of uh, aircraft uh, with Canada. The partnership has always been very strong. You know, we've been, we, we've, Canada, the Canadians were allies from day one. Actually, they started back in World War I. Uh, we're not going to go back into the previous centuries where things weren't exactly <laughs> when they when they decided to come and toast the uh, Washington D.C. Uh, the, well, that, it, it was a different set of it, it was a set, different set of history. Uh, but the point is that history has changed, and in in the 20th century and the 21st century, the relationship has been much stronger. And if you and and the results of that relationship are just by looking at the amount of trade that occurs on a daily basis between, let's take some uh, some statistics on Mexico and Canada. Uh, the Mexican daily trade with the United States is roughly about 1.4 billion per day, and with Canada it's a little bit more than that. I think it's 1.5, 1.6, something to that to that tune. And so when we talk about having a collaborative, prosperous, and secure Hemisphere. That's what we're talking about, because if you look at the trading block of, the, of North America, it's the greatest trading block in the entire world, and so that right there is is what the relationship is based on. I arrived in Northcom um, in 20, uh, 2006. Uh, at that point, uh, prior to me getting there, we'd had something like uh, with with Mexico, we'd had like six flag officer visits. By the time I finished the first year. Uh, we're up to about 30, and the relationship has gotten significantly stronger ever since then. Uh, with Canada, if you look at the evolution of NORAD, you know, by the way, NORAD is celebrating its 60th birthday in May, and uh, it, was, it was a relationship born out of a threat that was, was uh, menacing both the entire hemisphere. And the Canadian collaboration and, and the creation of NORAD and that is, is uh, easily seen just by the results. So if you look at the results, if you look at, at what the bottom line is, when you look at trade, when you look at the security of, of our hemisphere, it's, it's not perfect, but for the threats that we face, I think we've done a pretty good job, as I mentioned previously. Look at this hemisphere and look at the other, and the proof's in the pudding. Thank you. Chief? Yes, thanks. I, I would just say that I think that what drives or what, what has gotten us to the success and where things are working well is that there's a demand by our public uh, for safe communities, for uh, f free trade. And so that drives the policies that can then get us to collaborative action plans. There's a, there's a willingness amongst the governments to make sure that we meet those expectations. Um, in the context of Canada, before 9-11, the border wasn't as well recognized as, as what had to occur after. And so those implementations of the changes had to be done recognizing the culture as it was uh, and that people want a friction-free border uh, in both the northern and southern border. And there's, so there's a demand, there's a consumer demand. Um, some of that demand is not a healthy one. 
right? So we recognize that, that what happens in the states affects uh, both sides uh, and both borders. And so there's, there, and I've seen uh, real success in my career, especially at the headquarters where, where sort of paper matters, but the, these signed deliberate documents that say we're going to cooperate under these specific conditions for these specific events, uh, for these specific time frames, those always are, are uh, vehicles for leadership to adopt and, uh, and, and be enthusiastic about. And I've, I've seen uh, in the last several years, it started under the Calderon administration where we accept our responsibility for the drug demand in the United States um, and then that is leveraged by Mexico for them to understand uh, our co-responsibility uh, to help us solve the, our problem uh, and along the way. And then seeing that uh, leveraged and elaborated with uh, the Peña Nieto administration in which they are providing a leadership role uh, further south um, and, and providing mentorship and leadership in, uh, in uh, Central and South America uh, to help work on these problems that affect uh, us as well. So thanks. All right, um, we're open to questions. We have a gentleman here. Would you please identify yourselves? Tell us who you're directing the question to. Um, and let's keep it short, because we don't have a lot of time. Hi, my name is David Larder. I'm a staff writer with uh, Defense News. And w what I'm wondering is, with the threat from North Korea only rising, and it should diplomacy fail to denuclearize uh, the peninsula, uh, how do, uh, and this is for, I, I guess, General Knowles, uh, excuse me, General Hoover uh, or uh, Mr. Del Pena, uh, how do you see layered defense uh, playing into, uh, you know, uh, playing into the next, you know, intermediate and long term? How do you plan to build a, a more comprehensive BMD system to protect the homeland? And, and how we, might you be working with your partners on the stage for that? Right, I'll take that one. <laughs> Hey David, thanks. It's a it's a great question, and uh, I'll, I'll just say that you know our BMD system is strong, and and I have uh, full confidence in our our BMD system. I think North Korea is our current uh, uh, biggest threat that we face. People ask, you know, uh, the commander and I, you know, what keeps us up at night, and it's North Korea, and it is the threat of, from North Korea. Um, in terms of layered defense, I think. Uh, we work very closely with PACOM, um, where they have uh, more theater, ballistic missile type defense capabilities. And then, um, you know, in, in NORTHCOM, we look at uh, really wanting to fight the away game. And, uh, you know, when, um, when there is a uh, intercontinental ballistic missile threat to the United States, then we believe that our BMD system is going to be able to take it out and defend the nation. And so in terms of a layered defense, um, you know, again, it's, a, it's an effort that we do with USFK, with PACOM, uh, with our allies in the region, and then, uh, and then we rely on the, the, uh, the BMD system and the architecture. And uh, now having actually seen it work a number of times uh, for a number of missiles, <laughs> uh, I have full faith and confidence in the system. Um, I, I, I echo uh, General Hoover's words. As an air defender, I, I was always interested in, in anti-ballistic missile defense, and I believe that our technology base and uh, the capabilities that they're presenting on a constant basis with technology uh, increasing its ability to counter some of these threats uh, is, is, is key. And I think that events such as this uh, give you an opportunity to see just how far we've gotten with technology. But technology is a house also has to be coupled with partnerships because it's going to be that that this is truly a partnership kind of a of a, um, of a situation where we have to rely on the capabilities of others as well as our own, which gives us that multi layering. But uh, our system is strong, and uh, we're going to continue to make it even stronger. Great question over here. Good morning, uh, gentlemen. Uh, Ad Godinez, uh, Lieutenant Colonel, U.S. Army, currently assigned Office of National Drug Control Policy. Uh, as we've developed a shared understanding of the opioid threat impacting the entire continent um, and identified the third uh, party kind of shipping those uh, fentanyls that are actually killing Americans in the United States, how can we leverage the unilateral uh, capabilities of each of our countries the bilateral uh, cooperations between our countries and the trilateral cooperations of our countries to address this 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 epidemic that is killing 
uh, Americans from Mexico, the United States, and Canada every day? I'll just, I'll start and then maybe uh, pass it to the chief. And, um, but I think, um, I think we're getting past unilateral action. I mean, the, the, the uh, counter drug effort is uh, a problem that faces uh, Canada, faces Mexico, faces the United States, indeed faces the world economy. And, uh, and I, th I think we are well past, you know, having to operate unilaterally in, in that space. And I think uh, what you've been hearing this morning is the cooperation, the information sharing, and the interagency uh, efforts here in the United States as well as between our, our countries. You know, uh, General Robinson went down to the uh, southern border of Mexico uh, earlier in the spring to understand Mexico's southern border strategy um, because they recognize that the problem starts at their southern border to figure out how not only from a military perspective but how CBP and DHS, uh, how the whole of government on the, on the, uh, from the U.S. side can help Mexico further bolster their, for their southern border strategy. Um, and I, so I think the answer is not unilateral. The answer is trilateral. The answer is joint. The answer is interagency because there is no one country that can do it alone. Uh, each of us has our own capabilities and our own strengths um, that we can bring to better off uh, to, to uh, make North America a better place and to stem the flow of, of drugs and other things, other illicit cargo and, and materials going through the network. And so I would maybe chief it. Yeah, no, I would, I would agree. It, that problem as it is unfolding is a matter of the, the, the sharing of information, understanding where the pathways are, understanding what is inbound to the hemisphere, and sharing that quickly and often. And then as these uh, organizations change their tactics or use different types of material, uh, they use different precursors than to get ahead of that and then share that information. Um, one of CBP's core uh, benefits is this ability to target shipments. Uh, we can do that as they're coming into the hemisphere, and the more we know about the illicit pathways uh, in the hemisphere, the better we are at that, and that, that's only going to come from us sharing these things together. Let me, let me just add to that. One of the challenges that you're going to face with this new particular type of drug is that it's basically how do you piece this stuff together. If you're an organic chemist, and you can tie together those C's, H's, and O's and keep changing them around so that you can make something more potent uh, and, and make it cheaper, uh, it's going to be a constant challenge. By the way, so you have all of these different compounds that create these different types of drugs, and you, know, you have the Internet so that you can share that information with anybody else who wants to concoct uh, the, the same substance uh, and share it with everybody else, it's going to be an increasing problem. And when you couple that with the natural drugs that are out there, such as cocaine and heroin, and you lace them together, we have a mess on our hands. And so just to give you an idea of the nature of this problem, if you read, if you listen to the news, and which I believe yesterday they were talking about in Rico County, which is to the south of us, not very far, they've doubled the women's, uh, the, the population of women in prison in the last year. So that's what we're facing right now, and this is going to be one of those problems that we have to look at with a whole of government, whole of governments, with our partners, because it's getting out of our hands. It's one of these things that we have to wrap our heads around and figure out a better way. We've got to start hitting the demand side. We've got to deglamorize it. We've got to hold people accountable in all layers of society. Obviously, we're we're at the interdiction and in, in the uh, in the eradication end of the scale, but. Until you can address the issue of demand and until you can address the issue of what is it in our societies that's creating some of these problems. I mean, a lot of it has to do with if any time you turn on the TV, you're going to see take a pill for this, take a pill for that, take this, take that. And then if you go to the doctor, it's no longer fashionable to feel any pain whatsoever. Well, the problem with taking pain medication is that it has other repercussions. And that's one of those areas that you, if you want to talk about a challenge that's in, that, that's joint, combined, interagency, international, whole of government. That's where we are right now with, the, with, with what we're seeing with the drug problem. And oh, by the way, a lot of this doesn't get the same level of attention um, to see the whole thing, but a lot of the drugs are also flowing to the other hemisphere. And, and, and the other hemisphere is sending drugs 
even within their hemisphere, and they're getting more people addicted. A lot of the drugs that are flowing not only to the United States are also going out through Brazil and into Africa, into the Middle East, and all of that feeds into this network of people that are making money off of it, which can very easily commingle into military threats to our homelands. The only thing I would add, um, um, great comments, um, and uh, um, the last uh, comment about the network uh, out there and how they're all leveraging, uh, you know, how violent extremists are exploiting uh, the narcotics industry to raise money for weapons to do things uh, in other locations, uh, how malign actors are exploiting it all. It, it's, it, the evidence is out there and it's overwhelming. W what I would, uh, uh, I have trouble in, in Canada, I know you do in the States, and I imagine it's the same in Mexico, is, um, is waiting for the richness of discussion among civil leadership political and others uh, that actually brings it around to say what are the real threats to our society and how do we array because we move off of that direction we how do we array our, our incredible capabilities our assets towards the threats because we do that we live in a society and I don't want to uh, you know we, we sensationalize some issues and we end up as a result deploying far more capability and resources towards that problem set than some other things that are actually more, more dangerous, more lethal to our societies that are a lot closer to home. So uh, we, we have a challenge in trying to enable that um, and uh, you know fundamentally it's, it's, we, we have to be cognizant of that and figure out how we, uh, we move on that. Thanks. I don't know if General Granados wanted to make any comment or yeah. Sí, gracias. En estas operaciones en donde las Fuerzas Armadas son subsidiarias eh, de las autoridades civiles. In these operations where the uh, military are uh, in the secondary role to the civil uh, police forces. Entendemos que en lo que corresponde a la cooperación militar tenemos buenos resultados en compartir información. With regards to the military's role, we understand that we have good results uh, sharing information. En el apoyo de incremento para capacidades. In, uh, also increasing uh, capabilities y en esta combinación de esfuerzos and in this com combining of efforts hemos tenido algunos éxitos ante este gran problema que es el tráfico ilícito de drogas we've had some successes uh, in facing this great problem which is the illicit traffic of drugs tenemos la certeza de que la mejor forma de trabajar es la acción coordinada we're sure that the best way to work is through coordinated action. Y la suma de esfuerzos de todos, tanto las autoridades militares como las autoridades eh, civiles. And combining efforts, uh, including uh, military and civilian uh, authorities. Y la coordinación dentro del país y con otros países. And coordination uh, within the country as well as with other countries. Thank you. All right. I apologize that we're going to have to cut this short out of respect to our panelists. I think we've uh, run out of time. Obviously, there are many, many more questions <laughs> a lot of us have, but uh, this has been enormously enlightening and useful and actually hopeful, I think, as we look forward to, to the future. Uh, General Hoover, thank you. General Bose, thank you. General Granados, muchas gracias por su participación. Mr. Delapena, Deputy you, Assistant sir. Defense Secretary, and uh, Chief Vitello, thank you all for coming. Thank you all for your patience. Uh, and let's uh, join me in thanking our panelists.